Good evening and welcome everyone. Uh, my name is David Michaud. I'm the Program and Engagement Coordinator at the North Carolina Botanical Garden. Uh, we're so thrilled to have you all here on Zoom for this special presentation. And now it is my pleasure to introduce our speaker tonight. Arvis Bowman is an enrolled member of the Lumbee Indian Tribe of North Carolina and has worked as an elementary school teacher and a speech and language pathologist. He's also a founding member of the North Carolina Native American Council on Higher Education. Uh, Chigara and the Little People, The Legend of the Indian Corn, was the first children's book based on the Lumbee Indian culture. And Arvis currently lives in the Smoky Mountains of North Carolina with his family. So Arvis, I'll invite you to turn on your video and unmute and I'll do the opposite. Thank you, David. I uh, wanted to thank David David Michaud, and also Joanna Lelikas. Le 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 <laughs> oh, man, that name, Lelikas, is that correct, David? Yeah, you got it, Lelikas, yep. Okay, great. <laughs> um, and uh, so I'm indebted, and thank you so much, everyone, for, for attending this. Um, you look at a pine forest or any meadow, I remember an elder Welton Lowry once told me, he said, you see, you see this forest? I was walking with him outside and uh, beyond the forest was a golf course. He said, within this forest and golf course, there are herbs that can cure any disease. And I think he was right. And he, he partook of these herbs. He, he took um, bilberry for his eyes and he also drank the pine needle tea. And he was a uh, not only an elder, a keeper of the knowledge, but he was also um, a connoisseur. He believed it because he actually used it. So today's presentation is called Pine Tree Pharmacy. And as we go through this, I hope you can see that um, the natural remedies have their place. I would never advocate for replacing uh, natural herbal remedies or pharmaceutical drugs because the natural herbal remedies a lot of times take longer to work. They take you there, they, they, but they build up the body system. They, they don't have the negative side effects that a lot of your pharmaceutical drugs have. So this pharmacy is an excellent title, I think, for our presentation today. David, if we could go to the first slide, please. Um, I thought I'd start out with a little bit of um, my ethos, the way I believe. Um, one of my ancestors, which was from the Saponi tribe, because the Lumbee are made of Saponi and Eastern Suwon tribes, uh, Ned Bearskin shared with um, some of the explorers that were with him our, our uh, religion. So, uh, you know, it's every native nation is different. But for my ancestors, we've always, since we can remember, believed in one God. And that one God we call Guarowe um, made all the pleasant things happen. And, um, and one of the pleasant things, the great things he did for us is putting a calendar right on the back of the turtle shell. The first calendar that we used, there are 13 moons there is a book by a friend of mine, Joseph Bruchette, called 13 Moons on the Turtle's Shell or on the Turtle's Back. And um, we all had names for these different. If you count the central sections, you'll count 13 sections, which are our 13 moons. Right now, I, I didn't look at the moon last night, but I have a sneaking suspicion that we're transitioning from the frost moon to like the first greens moon or the dandelion moon. Some people also call this the strawberry moon. But uh, if you count along the outside, you see there's 28 sections. So there are 28 days in between each lunar cycle from new moon to new moon. And that is a wonderful thing that our creator had done for us by putting the calendar right there on the back of the turtle's back. Next slide, please, sir. This is our tribal seal. And as you notice on the outside, um, and you see some triangles. That is called the pine cone patchwork. And as I was sharing with David earlier, it's also called the Lumbee Star from um, our one of our healers, one of our holy men called Vernon Cooper, 
who made um, this design with his mother. But you can also see the medicine wheel, the, the four colors of man, also the four directions, and also the four virtues of man in the central. And this is the Lumbee tribal seal. Next, please. This is the Lumbee tribal flag. And as you can see, if you, if you look, you can see uh, the hawk is featured. Uh, that is a revered bird. The woodpecker is another revered bird. But if you look, we have the dogwood, tobacco, which is a sacred healing herb, and the corn. And also, if you look toward the outside, you see the pine tree. We are the people of the pine. And, um, and we depended on the pine for lots of things that we'll get into later as, as a tribal people. Next, please. Uh, one of our sister tribes, the Halawa Saponi tribe, you can also see, now if, um, if I'm wrong, please correct me, but I think what this representing, you can see the rain in the middle, you can see a corn stalk on the left and look like a pine tree on the right. And so that also shows that our principal food as Southeastern people was corn. Um, in my ancestral tongue, we call that kus and the pine tree. Um, so we we depended on these two plants very heavily. Next, please. Um, my tribe is the only tribe in the United States that is federally recognized without benefits. 1956 Lumbee Law was passed by both houses of Congress and President Eisenhower, but it was during a period of termination. Um, the last phrase of the Lumbee Act, nothing in this act shall lend benefits to the tribe. Um, the 1987 solicitor, William Lavelle, interpreted this as termination language. However, um, a more recent memorandum said that this phrase did not terminate or forbid the federal relationship. The Lumbee are the only tribe in the United States that, you know, that has federal acknowledgement, recognition without benefits or many benefits. These are a few, I wanted to show you, um, these are some of our wisdom keepers that, um, that I, I love to read about. Vernon Cooper to the left was a humble man. Uh, he was a man that treated all races. It didn't matter who you were. He would, if you would come in and you needed help, he would treat with herbs as well as um, the healing touch. Vernon Cooper um, is, was a predecessor, I think, of Deepak Chopra. And Deepak Chopra, not saying that he took any of Vernon Cooper's ideas, but Vernon, Vernon Cooper would oftentimes run his fingers over a person's body and was able to determine what was wrong with them by, by you know, a, a spot on them or, or a feeling as he'd run his hand over. He said, it's mind over matter. And that meant that it was more important to have faith in the healing process than the herb itself in many cases. Herbal Remedies of the Lumbee Indians, I was fortunate enough to co-author this with Lord Ed Oxendine. I did this for two reasons. Number one, felt like a lot of the Lumbee remedies were disappearing with our older generation. And number two, I wanted to show um, our people and other tribal nations that we have a lot of strong we have a vibrant healing culture. We have a vibrant arts and crafts culture. We are alive and living. We are a vibrant and alive tribal people. One of uh, my other heroes that I was fortunate to get to know was Sasui. We called him Earl, um, Earl Carter. And Earl was a very wise man. And he, he was an expert at using herbs he was our keeper of the sacred fire. And uh, unfortunately, we lost him four to five years ago. But the, he could, uh, he would often, we would often have our sacred circle at the edge of a pine forest, the pine forest at the North Carolina Indian Cultural Center near Pembroke. Next slide, side, please. Side, please. So uh, Vernon Cooper believed, as, as our, one of our principal medicine men, that the strength of the plant, he called it the sex of the plant, uh, was related to the condition of the soil and other factors. Uh, many Lumbee healers like 
Vernon would only select the spindly looking herbs and um, they would prepare them in different ways depending on what the treatment needed. A decoction would involve boiling the water out of it, getting the essence. An infusion would often involve soaking the roots or bark in alcohol or water. A poultice would boiling, was boiling the material down to a meal and often combining it with deer, um, later on um, pork oil or pork, you know, pork meat, and then putting a cloth over the affected area. And depending on the moon and the time of year was whether you would use the root, the stem, or the leaves. And again, we would uh, determine a lot of our songs, a lot of our ceremonies, a lot of what we talked about on what moon it was on um, one of the 13 moons on the back of the turtle shell. Next slide, please. So these are, this kind of shows you a de depiction of some of the different types of herbs in their presentation. You have first, you have the um, decoction, then, you know, which is boiling it down to its essence. And then you have the poultice. And then you can see an infusion where actually they, that uh, the individual left sprigs of the herb in to kind of boost the potency of the herb itself. Next, please. You also had teas, tinctures, and also, excuse me, salves, which was like the, the mis, mixed with the tallow oil, or you would have the tincture, which is just a small part of the herb that was diluted with vinegar or water. Next, please. Now in the land of the Lumbee, um, tobacco was king many years ago. You still see skeletons of old tobacco barns. Uh, the heart of Lumbee land, of course, is the Lumbee River. And um, this, uh, to the right, you can see Harvey Garbwin, uh, one of our ex-chiefs. And now our present chief is John Lowry. And uh, I think both men did an excellent job at promoting tribal unity and keeping our traditions alive. Next slide, please. Um, one of our... I guess next generation healers, unfortunately, we lost her as well, was Mary Sue Locklear. And there was, she detailed eight essential Lumbee herbs for healing. Those were pine, mullein, some people call it mullein. And I've, I've heard, and the reason I'm including these is because a lot of these grow around pine forest, especially the mullein or mullein. Sweet flag, blood root, bone set, rabbit tobacco, Indian tobacco, and catnip. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the uh, this is called the star or the pine cone patch word. And um, in the traditional language of many Lumbi, we call it Sue Nure, which was the traditional name for our pine tree. We would use the white rosin from the longleaf pine for kidney issues, many, many opportunities, and the brown rosin for diabetes or arthritis. I was talking with uh, Mr. Michaud earlier, and he, he I learned, uh, wonderful gentleman, he, I learned something from him that I hadn't heard before, that um, a lot of times that pine needle tea can be used for uh, allergies. Um, one thing that we used to do that Vernon Cooper and also uh, Sisui would advocate is doing a homeopathic remedy. If you were allergic to pine, pine trees or any kind of pollen, then maybe you would need to make a tea from that, a homeopathic remedy. That's an herbal approach. But pine top tea traditionally among our people was used for respiratory infections. Earlier, back in the mid to late 1800s, Many Lumbee men were engaged in what they called naval storage, naval stores, because many medicines back in that century and the general public was made from the pine rosin. And also, um, not only medicine, but wooden ships, tar, pitch, and turpentine were called the naval stores. One thing about uh, the um, especially um, one type of pine tree that we'll get into later. 
The inside cambium layer, but especially the white pine, many early settlers and many Native American tribes, especially when food was scarce, would use this cambium layer of the white pine as a food source that could be dried, beaten, and, and used as a flour to make bread. Usually a wide strip was taken around around the uh, pine white pine tree, and um, the only problem, it would kill the tree. But it would also, it would, you know, if, if um, you could harvest enough, then, then that was an effective food source and was a filling food source for a lot of early settlers and uh, native folk in the Southeast. We revere the pine tree, especially for Lumbee folk, for shelter. Uh, when I'm talking to my children um, in speech a lot of times, I said, did all Native Americans live in teepees? And some of them would say, you my, you my Cherokee uh, boys and girls. Yeah, yeah, we did. But I said, think about it. Do we see any buffalo around? And they think about it. And they say, no. I said, Native tribes used what they had. So, um, you know, so around... Lumbee land, you had a lot of pine trees. And so, you know, around, around Catawba, you know, areas in the, and Eastern Suwon, you had different types of pines. So that's what we used because we had so many trees that we could use and pitch that we could put in between the cracks. And as we mentioned earlier, we used the pine tree for food, the cambium layer, as well as medicine, arts and crafts, and tools. Next slide, please. Uh, I wanted to show you, this is um, not too many folks harvest the pine sap from longleaf pines anymore. Um, during Henry Berry Lowry's time around 1868, there became a pine needle, excuse me, a pine bark infestation that killed a lot of the uh, longleaf pine trees in Robinson County. So a lot of Lumbee men traveled down to Georgia, especially in the area around Claxton, Georgia to harvest naval stores and also uh, medicines for the longleaf pine. So you can see in the first slide, uh, the gentleman harvesting pine sap. The second slide is they would boil it down and to either make pine, excuse me, tar pitch or turpentine. And in the modern day also the, you know, it's got such a pleasant, um, scent and also so many medicinal purposes that um, several manufacturers have started doing uh, pine longleaf tree essential oils, which I've never seen that before, but I uh, I would like to try and smell it. It's, uh, I bet you it's wonderful. Next slide, please. Uh, this is uh, one of my friends, um, wonderful lady, uh, Nancy Strickland Chavis. And um, these, I think these longleaf pine needle baskets were probably made by uh, elders. One of, uh, one of the main elders that does a wonderful job is Loretta Oxendine, uses the tobacco twine and then wraps it around. And some of these are so tightly woven that they're waterproof. Next slide, please. I wanted to go ahead with uh, Mr. Michaud's help and show you um, uh, a way that um, we can make or pine needle tea is made. And then I would like to uh, relate a tribe down south, the Alabama Cushada tribe, that shows the traditional way that pine needle tops were gathered. Today, we're gonna to go over the benefits of pine needle tea. The pine tree has been used for lumber and has been used for medicine. Speaking of medicine, pine needle tea is actually very high in vitamin C. It has been used for hundreds of years to treat scurvy, vitamin C deficiency, and it's also very tasty. Just like the previous video before, I got uh, dog fennel. And this stuff is amazing at starting fires. Once you get your tripod all set up, you got your firewood all collected, and go ahead and make you a little bird's nest out of your fire starter.
go ahead and fill your pot up with water. You want to have it over your fire, bring it to a boil, and then we'll start processing the pine needles. Today's pine needle tea, we're using loblolly pine. Uh, you can identify it by the leaves that it has on it. It has a cluster of three leaves. So, have a cluster of three leaves and many, many different leaf branches on each branch. Norfolk Island Pine and U Pine are not true pine trees and are very poisonous. So if you have those, do not use them for this tea. I've cut a good, I don't know, inch and a half diameter or inch of uh, diameter of pine needles. And then you take and you cut them in half. And once your water comes to a bowl, you take your pot off of the uh, fire and you put your needles in and let it sit for about 10 to 15 minutes. Now your water is gonna turn a little yellow and the leaves are gonna turn yellow as well. Let them rest for a few minutes and then let it cool down and you're gonna have a delicious home remedy for all your colds. Once it's cooled down enough, you can use a bandana put over your cup to strain out all the particles. What we have here is a cup of pine needle tea. That's some good stuff. The next time you feel like you got a cold coming on, or you got the flu coming on, or any kind of those symptoms, try you some of this. It'll boost your immune system, and it's very good. If today, it starts with a prayer, thanking the Creator for the bounty of the land. Walter Celestine is an elder of the Alabama Cushada tribe of Texas and he's on Fort Benning harvesting longleaf pine needles. Today the tribe is located outside of Houston, but the harvesting of pine needles dates back to the earliest days when they were located in their aboriginal lands of what is now Georgia and Alabama. The longleaf pine needles of this area are harvested annually and then stored in darkness for six months in order to retain their green color. It is all a part of the Alabama Cushada tribe's efforts to maintain the traditions of their people. Culturally, it's important because our elders made baskets, and that's how they provided for their families, trading or selling these baskets. The Alabama Cushada people and Fort Benning engage in regular consultations as part of an initiative to improve relationships with federally recognized tribes. November is Native American Heritage Month, and each year the Alabama Cushada Cultural Program comes to Fort Benning and gives presentations in the elementary schools in order to teach the true history of Native Americans from this area. For more information, visit alabamacushada.com. David Wright, Fort Benning, Georgia. Now there are several different types of pine trees. Um, one is called the Virginia pine. Um, it's also good for that pine needle tea and you'll find this around Robinson County area as well. Next slide, please. Uh, white pine is kind of out of the Robinson County area. It's more, I guess, toward Chapel Hill and West. A lot of times the white pine is called the Widowmaker because it looks like, if you look at the white pine, um, it's like looking at spokes on the wheel. Um, if you look up and there are branches that go almost like a wagon wheel that goes all the way up the tree. It's called the Widowmaker because if you camp out underneath one of these pine trees uh, during a windstorm, they're really um, susceptible to break and they become like spears that could rain down on you. So. If you're ever camping out, please do not camp out under a white pine tree or else you might get a nasty surprise. 
Um, white pine, as we mentioned earlier, um, have pine nuts with and the dough made from the cambium layer, and we mentioned why it's called the widow maker a lot of times. This kind of shows the cambium layer of this. You have the outer bark, the phloem, and the inner, inner bark of the cambium, um, and then the xylem. I guess the cambium and xylem could be used for this dough making process. Next, please. Uh, even today, the white pine is um, in a lot of herbal applications, and I call them smell good shops, you know. Um, white pine and ginger salts is, is something I found from um, a milk and honey herb store, and also a white pine cough, cough syrup was also um, marketed by the same company. Pine saw, I've often wondered, well, does pine saw really have pine in it? Well, in 1928 it did, but since then they went to more commercial, I guess, um, non-pine oil. Um, so uh, I guess maybe more ammonia, more cleaning agents, but it did start out, pine saw did as mainly pine oil for cleaning. I wanted to go over a few um, herbs that you'll find in a pine forest, just not that it's called the Pine Tree Pharmacy. Um, so um, one of these herbs that I know my people used was the bay tree. The crushed root of the bay tree was used for head boils, food seasoning. If you ever used old bay seasoning, then you're familiar with the bay tree. Often the lard bay mixture was um, when we made soap was stirred by the Old Bay or a magnolia stick to give the soap a good fragrance. Next, please. Bear grass, the top of a pine tree, uh, excuse me, a top of a palm tree, grows near a uh, pine forest, also known as Adam's Needle. Uh, the Cherokee would use the broom, broom sedge and amaranth with bear grass to make what they call green corn medicine. They would also use bear grass sap as a soap, soap substitute. Um, our, the Lumbee used it to treat sores, and, and that was often combined with palo to make like a salve. Next, please. Broom sedge, you see this still along highways and, and within the context of pine forest. Um, broom sedge along with... Um, they, uh, one of my favorite books is The Education of Little Tree. Um, the man might, might or might not have been uh, Cherokee, but uh, he knew so much about native culture. It was amazing. He's talked about how when you grow watermelon, if you take a broom grass, broom grass stalk, and lay it crossways on the watermelon, that uh, if it stayed crossways, it was right. But if it went the other way, it was not right. So you could, uh, usually I just thunk it. I usually don't use broom sedge, but if you ever have some around, then you might want to try that. The truth, the tea from the roots were used for false frostbite and sores. Uh, Susui, many skins, uh, used the broom sedge in burial rites. And we also used broom sedge with tallow to make a hemorrhoidal salve. Cattail, you talk about a multi-purpose herb along with dandelion, it is the cattail. Sticky juice in between the leaves can be used as an antiseptic. Uh, Lucy May Hammond's another lumby healer compared the softness of the inside to rabbit fur. She often sometimes used this as a um, pillow, you know, put in her pillows because so, uh, it's very, very soft. Roots can be peeled and dried and made into flour, just like the cambium layer of the pine. A patch is also used the pine, the cattail pollen for the coming of age ceremony. Next, please. A uh, cedar is all we did not burn, or the Cherokee did not burn cedar. We often did. Um, I know that many of our my ancestors came from the mother town of Jawara in the western part of the state. And we would often bury our holy men under the roots of the, what we call the suwesi, the redwood, the cedar. 
but uh, the head men, some, sometimes the, the Lumbee, my ancestors, would use the pine, the cedar tops for whooping cough. Uh, but Vernon Cooper discouraged this because if any of you have pets and use cedar shavings, they sometimes do not work out really well because they can cause a lung infection. And our healer Vernon Cooper said there's too much chance of using this uh, for lung infection if we use, you know, as it is a tea. So you really, he cautioned to use it in very small or moderate amounts. The four sacred herbs among the Lumbee and, and, and several other southeastern tribes were cedar, sweet grass, sage, and tobacco. Next, please. Dogwood is um, Vernon Cooper ate the raw dogwood berries for chills. Uh, the tea from the sap mark can be used for malarial fever. And um, it was called dog tree in the language of many of my ancestors. And also many of the Southeastern tribes, including the Lumbee, used the dogwood root for the red dye. Next. Mullen and Marlene. What a, you, if, you, if you go down Highway 74 from, say, Monroe to Robinson County, you could almost just point and, and there would be a mullein or a mullein plant. It's known as mud, bunny or mule's ears. And you talk about another incredible herb. Mothers used to use them when they didn't have baby diapers. They were so soft they could use them as baby diapers. People, uh, many of the ancestors, if they had holes in their shoes, they would put them in their shoes and the moccasins to keep their feet warm. But there has really been, um, I had a gentleman that's a friend of mine, a Pakistani gentleman that talked, called me about a year ago and said, I have mullein or mullein growing in my backyard. Have you heard what it does? I said, I've heard a little bit. And he said, it's got incredible demulcent properties. That means you can use it in a tea or some people even smoke it and, 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 and it, it loosens the mucus and, and, and it's good for the respiratory system. I said, really? And, and so we, we had a good conversation about that, but there's some modern scientific studies that are going on about the great effects of mullet. One thing that really surprised me when I went to the Indian Cultural Center is I knew sassafras grew in the eastern part of the state, but I didn't realize the symbiotic relationship that sassafras has with pine. You will often find sassafras plants growing right beside a pine tree, and usually the pine needles discourage a lot of plant growth, but the sassafras tree or plant seems to thrive. It is another magnificent herb. Um, we do not like to burn sassafras wood, and it's been shown to be carcinogenic. But I wanted to show you a video um, of one of my friends up in the mountains. Um, I used to survivalist, lives about five miles down the road from me, that shows um, the great things about sassafras. His name is David Grasty. Dave Grasty, uh, 20 years in the military, and I am doing an interview for the Mountaineer. So, uh, this is one of my favorite wild edibles here, sassafras. Uh, the key identifying feature for it, it's going to have three different leaf shapes. You got your oval shaped leaf, you got your spade shaped leaf, and then you got your mitten shaped leaf. Uh, there's only one other plant that has three different leaf shapes like this, and that's red mulberry, but it's going to have spikes on it, uh, or teeth on the leaves. This is one of my favorite wild edibles. Um, this is what root beer was made from. The roots smell like root beer. Um, they did take it out of the survival manuals because sassafras has a carcinogen in it, saffron. But if you live in a house, you have more carcinogens in your house than sassafras has in it. So, uh, what I love about it is that it is a prehistoric plant. This was actually around when the dinosaurs were. Uh, most of these other trees were not around when the dinosaurs were. Uh, but 
you can eat the young leaves right off and they taste like fruity pebbles. Um, so look for the young ones. No, it's kind of like a grab and go type thing. Mm -hmm. When the leaves start getting older, um, they're not fun to eat, but you can still use them as a spice. Uh, a lot of Creole recipes. They have a saying down in Louisiana, it's not gumbo if it doesn't have sassafras in it. So they'll take the old leaves, they'll grind them up into a spice, and they'll put that in their gumbo. Uh, if you notice the leaves, they don't have a lot of insect damage to them. That's because insects don't like them. Insects don't like them. So you can actually take the leaves, and they have a lemony smell. Get the oils out of them, and rub them on your skin as a natural insect repellent. And you can dig the roots up. Uh, and make root beer flavored tea. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yep, sassafras, one of my favorites. All right. All righty, Mr. Grasty. Um, Mr. Grasty is amazing just going around and picking out uh, different things, you know, that um, that you can eat. Uh, lemon mustard is one he picks, just pick up off the ground, you know, and, and eat it. And this, what an amazing way to live, right? I, I think it's pretty cool. Um, there is other uses for pine rosin than, um, than just medicine. If you're, say you're in the woods and you don't have a flashlight and you're near a, in a pine forest, then you can actually make a pine tree uh, torch. This kind of details a way that you can do that if you wanted to, if you wanted to experiment. Just it's just a brief I got video. It will burn. This is about the size, maybe a half a golf ball. If you rolled it up, I wrapped it around this stick, smashed it down on there. We're going to light it on fire and see how long it burns. Maybe. Third time's the charm. There we go. All right, start your stopwatch right now. So we're at about six minutes now, a little over six minutes, and it's still going, still burning. Right about now is when we'd want to be lighting our our uh, our second torch. So we've got six or seven minutes out of a torch, and then we'd have another torch and another torch and another torch. We could, if we had three or four of these things, we could have you know 20, 20 plus minutes of uh, of time in a, in a dark space, twenty minutes of light. Something to think about. It is. And now it's out. So we've got about seven, maybe a little seven and a half minutes ish, give or take, something like that, uh, off of about half of a golf ball size of pine resin, the still sticky stuff, not the dried out stuff. Um, so that's how long a torch will last. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and share. All right. By the way, uh, I'd be glad to, um, D uh, David, if it would be fine, we'll skip, skip the um, uh, the pine sap glue. Um, sure. I'm sure these will be um, online if you want to see how to make pine sap glue, which is an effective glue if you don't have anything to put something together out out in the woods sure. so, all, all of the the videos that you're seeing tonight i'll share those links in the follow-up email so you can rewatch these and share them as you please thank you thank you sir all right um you do want to play this first one right or, or... yes um okay. uh, let me just preface this by this is called fat wood our tribe called it lightered but it is a great way to start fires, rich pine. And it this is 
a great video showing that if you're in a pine forest, how to collect this fat wood or lighter. So what I'm going to do is um, look for something that's dead. I have a dead tree here, a dead tree there, and this is still a dead standing tree here. Okay. So again, I can't really get into the main trunk of this because it's just too big and thick and I don't want to put the time into that, but I can get into these dead branches. So we're going to get the camera readjusted and I'm going to chop into one of these branches and we're going to take a quick look and see if we find any fatwood here. Okay, so here's what we got going on. We're looking at this dead standing tree. Again, that branch that I identified a second ago, and we're just gonna cut down. The closer we can cut into this trunk, the better. We just wanna be careful with this, guys. We wanna make sure we're not um, cutting ourselves or injuring ourselves during this process. So I can tell you already, two chops in, that this is absolutely gonna be an awesome piece of fatwood, for sure. So I'm just gonna take my time, because again, I wanna get down on the inside if I can, now look at that. You can see all that resin built up in there. Okay, so let's go over to one of our camps, process this, and I'll show you how you process it further to make fire. So we don't need much more than an ax and a knife really to process this out. So really, all I'm gonna do is I'm gonna start out by just giving that a little whack, splitting that open, Probably with my fingers a little bit. And it's been pouring down rain here, so there's a little bit of moisture now, but it's not gonna hurt anything at all, guys. It's really not. So this is what we're looking for. We're just looking for all that resin. It should, when we smell it, smell like turpentine. That's a good indicator that there's fatwood in there. Now, Pennsylvania fatwood is nothing like Georgia, South Carolina type fatwood, even Florida. But what we want to do next is take the back of our knife that has a nice sharp spine on it and we just want to start to create shavings. Uh, so we have our pile. If this was a true situation that I need this fire going, um, with this much fat wood, I'm going to probably double that amount. So I always take, take my ferro rod Give it one, you know, just a starter stroke. And I say that, um, a lot of people always laugh when I say that, but we're really looking when we do this, not to get too much in a fair rod, to make ridges. So my first one's not going to be as efficient as my second one, because once I scrape it the first time, I created two ridges, and that ridge is what I'm going to scrape off. But this might light just with the first one. Not that one. Whoop. And there you go. So that's it, finding fat wood for beginners all the way out to starting a fire. It's a very simple process. And uh, you can see this is still burning, so this really lasts a long time. Really, to be honest with everybody, this is my go-to for the most part. I always carry fat wood around in my pack with me, and if I'm gonna start a fire, uh, even just to make a cup of coffee, it's usually started with fat wood. You could take shavings from there to extend it out even further. But um, you can see this works out really, really well. So definitely give it a try. And if you're a beginner, you know, just get out there and just do it. But find, a, find somewhere where there's evergreens, go through that, um, split some areas out, some wood, and uh, figure it out. You'll get it and uh, join the ranks. So this was Dan Wolak with Coldcracker Bushcraft. I hope you enjoyed this video. And if you haven't already, check us out at coldcrackerbushcraft.com. And until the next video, stay in the woods, guys. So if you're in a wilderness situation or a survival situation, you know that you need shelter, you need fire, and then you need water. So, um, you know, if you look at it, the pine tree can provide both the shelter and the fire. So you've got, if you're in a pine forest, you've got a lot of that licked. So um, this kind of shows uh, navel store medicine from the longleaf pine. Uh, you can see that um, it was Dr. A.W. K.N.L. Um, kit for kidney and liver trouble, for coughs, colds, croup, bronchitis, asthma, and whooping cough. So that's one of the old um, remedies that you might have seen in the turn of the century and turn of the 20th century. Next, please. I wanted to go ahead and um, show you the... Um,
this is actually an historic thing. I hope my people don't think that I'm turncoat. I'm not. I think that um, we all need each other. We all need to work together for the good of each other. We need to be kind to each other. Um, and it's bothered me that several of the Lumbee and the and some members of the Cherokee have not saw eye to eye on some things lately. And they're they're brother and sister people. I I do I teach Cherokee children every day. Uh, with um, I even teach some of them how to speak Cherokee. <laughs> I know a few words like Shio and Oshiguazu. And um, of course, I tell them that Lumbee, you would say Tanake and Tinyedu. But um, I this is the first time Lumbee and a Cherokee have worked together on a children's book. Um, I was lucky enough to find a wonderful illustrator, Mary Beth Timothy. And she, uh, this book is slated to come out in February 2025. And the reason I put this in here is because the rabbit uses fat wood or lightered to bring fire to the rest of the animals. Of course, he has to go through some cold weather and his feet getting tickled by the northwestern wind and all, all sorts of other things. But without fat wood or the lightered, um, according to this traditional tale, that um, there would be no, the buzzards would still have the fire and it would not go to the rest of the animals. This is, I think this will be the cover. And if we could look at the next slide, please, Mr. David. These are some pictures from the book that uh, Miss Mary Beth has done. I thought she did a really nice job showing the northwestern wind kind of snickering behind the tree and pinching the tail of the rabbit. And then the rabbit tries at last to cover up with a bunch of pine needles, and that won't even work because his feet are sticking out. As uh, Mary Beth and I were working on this, discovered that there is a particular type of rabbit that makes its it's a subspecies of the cottontail rabbit, lives in Robinson County called the marsh hare. And um, there is no fur between the toes of the marsh hare. And so um, this tale talks about why there is no fur between the toes of the marsh hare rabbit. Next, please. And so that ends um, our presentation. I was wanting to leave about 10 minutes, I see we have um, eight eight questions or comments in the chat section. Uh, or if know, anyone that, else. Was, that was mostly me just, just telling folks how to submit their questions. Okay, okay. So um, I'd be glad to, you know, entertain any questions that you had at this time or um, any comments. Um, this is, I want to thank the North Carolina Botanical Society, Go Tar Heels UNC. Uh, for allowing me to present and and talk about the wonderful um, longleaf and other pine trees. We're just as thrilled to have you back at the garden. I, I wish we were here in person, but these virtual webinars are, are very convenient for everyone, and, and we're, we're thrilled that we could, uh, we could host this tonight. Uh, I have not seen any questions come through, which is surprising knowing our audience. Uh, they're always full of Does anybody brain. have any questions <laughs> um i see some comments um from you i heard that making tea of pine needles may help folks with pollen allergies that is very true um let's see um thank you mr white for uh your comment mm -hmm. gabrielle uh, thank you so much for your comment i did want to show something else um i have this is called a gorget if you can see uh, we are, yeah, we're on Turtle Island, and 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 I, for one, um, I know at powwows we always honor our troops and the American flag, and I, I, I think that those are the heroes. Our military folks are our heroes, and they're they because they defended Turtle Island, both Indian, Native, and non-Native people, and they're deserve they always deserve our respect and our appreciation. So anyway, this gorget shows Turtle Island. And as much since we are people of pine, you can see right here, it is the pine tree. And I don't think it shows in, in, in kind of an indirect uh, pine cold patch where it's star design around here too. But this is one of my favorite pieces of jewelry. And 
because it has a story behind it. It talks about our, you know, uh, our dependence on the pine and the reason that we revere the turtle. That is beautiful. And, and as you've been sharing now, the questions are really starting to roll in. So let's, let's get through these. Um, does it exist yet, or is someone working on a comprehensive book of all this botanical knowledge with sections for food, medicine, etc.? I want to, you know, I'm not trying to sell. I, I don't have any stock, but um, I have a friend, Angela Lockbeer Queen, that has taken um, the the book the book that I did and Miss Laura Epps and I did, and um, and and the beauty of her book is that she takes our herbal remedies and she not only shows how we used to use them, but has modern, um, modern applications on how to use them and, and their medicinal as well as some useful properties. So I, I really think she has done a magnificent job in her book about herbal remedies. So, uh, and she's Lumbee and, and she, I think she has her own website too. So I'm really if I can say I'm proud of her, I'd be, I'm proud of what she's done. Mm -hmm. All right. This question, um, I'm not too sure I understand. Is there a different use for green needles than dried pine needles? Sometimes I think the more potent is the green needles. But if you, you know, if you're looking to reduce the potency, then I think the pine, the like the, Alabama Cusada would dry theirs for a little bit to maybe reduce some of the sharpness and um, maybe, you know, you don't have to probably have to use more with the dried. But uh, to me, the, the, we used to use the pine needle tree as a spring tonic, you know, sassafras was used as a spring tonic. So was pine needle tea to help thin the blood, get your get your body moving after the long winter, and uh, we would often use the green new growth. You know, you notice that on many conifers that the new growth is a a, a really bright type green, and that's the same same as you know with the with the, many of the pines. Um. We've, we've talked a lot about the medicinal qualities of the, the needles. Um, do you know if the sap or pitch have any medicinal benefits or qualities? To be honest, I haven't studied that much. I know that they were used in, in um, a lot of colonial medicines, especially the turpentine. Um, I know the tar and pitch were used in houses and, and with building of ships and sealing of ships. But um, I don't know any modern applications of the turpentine, but I know it was a, you know, it, without the pine tree, a lot of medicines around the turn of the 20th century wouldn't have existed. And we do have a couple of uh, programs coming up about uh, naval stores and, and other uses of, of, of pine and in industries. Um, so I'll, I'll drop a link in the chat in just a moment here. Um, is there a particular species of turtles whose plates correspond to the 13 months? The box turtle, and I have, I wish I had brought my snapping turtle shell, have one about this big. Wow. That my son, uh, yeah, we have some friends that love to eat snapping turtle. So my, my son harvested it for them. And um, it also has the 13 and, and the 28 around. I know the box turtle does as well. So I think most turtle species, if, if I'm not mistaken, do have that calendar on their back. So, and I think it was put there purposely so that we would, oh yeah, this is, this is the green corn moon. This is the corn harvesting moon. This is when we tell these stories. This is when we do these dances. This is when we, uh, you know, cause without beautiful thing about the Lumbee and a lot of other uh, native cultures is that, we never wrote anything down, really. Sequoia was one of my heroes. He invented the syllabary, and there were several other tribes that have written symbols for each one of their sounds. But as for the most part, we we handed it down. So each generation would add uh, their interpretation, their 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 spin, if you want, on on the um, on the story. But it was passed down. 
it was passed down and that that was you know there's a beauty in that but the bad part is if one generation doesn't tell then it's lost forever it's the reason they say one when an elder dies it's like a library is burnt down because you're, you're losing all that law, knowledge all that wisdom all that history so absolutely yeah and a follow-up from one of the earlier questions about um the the um the pitch and and um sap um a, a user commented that her friend from india said that um she grew up with her mom rubbing turpentine on her chest to help her breathe rather better which oh, if you've ever gotten a whiff of turpentine uh yes that <laughs> <laughs> that would do the trick you can see it's more like Vicks vapor rub, you know, I know you use the mentholatum or whatever, but the, the smell just, I can just imagine it opening up your sinuses and you say, whoa, you know. And there's another plug in the chat for your book, um, How the Oceans Came to Be, which features the, the turtle calendar. Yeah, I was really lucky to work with uh, Alfreda Bertrack Algio. She's a pipe carrier for um, the uh, Lakota tribe. And um, She's wrote, she's written, she's taken the stories of her grandfather and, and, and put them, you know, amazing. Like he was picked up by a tornado or a wind and put down, you know, this is a true story. And just her hearing her elders tell these stories and she's put them into novels now. And, um, and she worked with me on this book. So she's not only an amazing writer, but she's also a great illustrator as well. So Look up her name, Alfreda Bertrack Algio, and I've been wanting, uh, that's the next thing on my list. I've got to, I want to look up her books and read them because uh, she, she's gifted in a lot of ways. Uh, thank you all so much for, for joining this evening. Uh, thank you for the, the wonderful questions that you've shared. Mr. Bowman, any, any parting words for the crowd? I'm just uh, indebted to you and, and everyone who, you know, put up with uh, my ramblings. So, um, but thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, David. Thank you, Joanna. Thank you, UNC, for hosting this. More to come, I'm sure. All right, we'll let everyone get on with their evenings. Thank you once again for joining and, and have a great, great night. Take care, y'all. You too. Thank you. <laughs>